Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, and taking the time on a Thursday morning, an hour of your precious time in the working week. Very, very grateful. I hope there's not too many sore heads after the, the England match uh, last night, uh, which was a fantastic result, as I'm sure we can all agree. Um, well, look, so we've got a very special guest today. We've got Katia with us, who's going to talk all things compliance and how that relates to SEO and why it's so important, particularly in the current time. Uh, before I hand over, I'm just going to give you a very, very quick introduction uh, to us and the Digital Maze, and then I'll hand over to somebody much more intelligent than I uh, to talk about what we're all here to hear about today. So just very, very quickly with the Digital Maze, we're a full service marketing agency. We cover everything from web design and development, uh, SEO, so search engine optimization, uh, which is Katia's um, speciality, and PPC as well. We're based in the Midlands. We've got clients ranging from uh, all the way from you know e-commerce e um, retailers. We've got um, windows doors. We've, we've got everything in between. Effectively, we there's no there's no brief we can't handle effectively. We've um, got 34 members of the team here. We're based in Derby in the Midlands. And that is us in a nutshell. I've got Katia with us today. She's from our SEO team, and she's going to talk all about compliance. Uh, over to you. Cool. Thank you. Um, so my name is uh, Katia. And um, just before I start anything, I want to say this uh, webinar is recorded, and it will be available on our socials and our websites. Um, I'm also going to make a resource document so you don't have to take any notes. You can just sit back, relax, um, and enjoy. And uh, we'll also have questions at the end. So if you think of anything that you want to ask, just write it down and then, or type it in the chat box and we'll look over it uh, towards the end. So my name is Katja Klein, and um, I have been in digital marketing for seven years, and I have been specializing in SEO for five years. I also don't want to be like Beyonce, and I'll get into that later. So today we'll be talking about accessibility in SEO, which means we're going to be talking about how to make the internet a better place for everybody, including the bottom line for your business. So um, you would think that there would be native captions, but there is not. Um, we've gotten in touch with uh, Livestorm to see if they could uh, have this feature, and they said they would look at it. So in the meantime, if you need native captions um, and you're using Safari, you can click on that um, system settings button, uh, go to accessibility, click to captions, and then toggle closed captions on. If you're using Chrome, you can hit that little three dot button in the top right, head down to settings, uh, hit accessibility, and then go to live captions and toggle that on. So there's a, there's a good message here, which is that it's usually on the user's responsibility to uh, provide their own live captions, which if you have a permanent disability, um, you'll most likely um, already have this on. But it's not in place for people who have temporary disabilities. And we'll get into temporary disabilities in a moment. So the question is, should this be a default feature that people can just choose to turn off instead? I don't know. Anyways, we'll get onto the webinar now. Uh, so what is accessibility? Who even knows? Billie Gina does. And she is an SEO and an accessibility expert. And she recently opened up one of her webinars with three great questions. And I'm going to copy them. And they are, have you ever tried to use your website without a mouse? Have you ever tried to use your website with a screen reader? Or have you ever tried to use your website by tabbing through the site? And that's by using the tab key to navigate the website. These are all ways that people with disabilities navigate the internet. And so when I say um, people with disabilities, what does that mean? Uh, the most common ones that we think of are blindness, deafness, permanent limited mobility, and ultimately they use a screen reader or other assistive technology to use the internet. Okay, but how many people does this actually affect? Um, we'll look at that 3% in a second because that's really important. The amount of people that it affects, 25% um, of users who use the internet have some sort of disability. And 20% of users use assistive technology to browse the internet. And it's also really important to remember that these numbers underrepresent the need for accessibility because likely there are people that are not reporting this. That 3% is the amount of the internet that is optimized for accessibility. So in SEO, we say this is an amazing keyword opportunity because we have our very, very high search volume. 
25% of users with some sort of disability. We also have our very, very low competition, which is only 3% of the internet that's optimized for accessibility. So if you were to optimize your website for accessibility, you would be making your website available among this 3% of the internet that 20% of users will use. So why wouldn't you wanna do it? Okay. We haven't talked about this yet, but this only represents one of three different types of disabilities. So we have permanent, temporary, and situational disabilities. And I'm gonna keep this 3% here because we wanna remember that only 3% of the internet is optimized for accessibility. Um, so temporary and situational disabilities could be you at any point in your life. Temporary disabilities include perhaps you broke your right hand and you can't use it, so you need left-handed assistive technology. Maybe you have cataract surgery and you have a hard time seeing different um, contrasts in color, and so you need to use a website that has high contrasts in color so that you can see it. Maybe you're in a really loud or a very quiet place and you don't have headphones, so you need to watch a video with captions on it. There's loads of times where you may find that you need accessibility features for a website. And we're going to uh, move into a real life example here where I introduce you to my friend Linda. And Linda has just had a baby and she accesses the internet on her phone. And she just remembered that she needs to order some new onesies for baby because baby is growing very fast. She goes to the website that she knows uses left-handed assistive technology so that she can hold baby in her right hand. It's great. Baby starts crying. So now she knows she only has 10 to 15 seconds max to place this order before she needs to put her attention back on baby. Luckily, this website is very accessible. Buttons are big. It's easy to navigate. Checkout process is smooth. She makes the purchase with five seconds to spare and is able to rock baby back to sleep. So now baby's asleep and she's feeling pretty proud of herself because she's a mom. She also works a part time job. She's pretty exhausted, but she knows that she deserves a treat. So she is going to order some skincare products um, on her phone. She is watching videos on different skincare products and how to use them, what they do. And luckily these videos have captions so she can watch these videos while baby is sleeping. She finds the skincare product she wants, she places the order, and now the onesies and the skincare products are on their way for her. Accessibility wins. Why is accessibility important? So we're gonna be looking at three different things here. We're gonna be looking at the legal, ethical, and business case for accessibility. And we'll start with the boring one, which is the legal case. And we are going to talk about what Beyonce, Five Guys, and Domino's Pizza all have in common. But first, I'm going to talk about three different regulations. So these are three regulations that are um, uh, that we in the UK should be taking into consideration. The first one is the Equality Act in 2010. <clears throat> so the Equality Act in 2010 states that um, it is illegal to discriminate against various groups, including people living with disabilities. It also states that websites must be accessible to all users. And more specifically, a quote from this says, this duty to make responsible, uh, reasonable adjustments requires service providers to take positive steps to ensure that disabled people can access services. This goes beyond simply avoiding discrimination. It requires service providers to anticipate the needs of potential disabled customers for reasonable adjustments. And then we also have the Public Sector Bodies Act of 2018, which is the reason that our gov.uk website is super easy to navigate. Uh, this states that all websites in the public sector need to follow the WCAG 2.2 guidelines. And we'll look into this in more detail in a few slides. And then finally, we have the European Accessibility Act and that comes into effect in June next year. This states that any business and any or any website that does business with the EU needs to adhere the, to the WCAG 2.2 guidelines. So we have a year to prepare if you do any sort of business. business. So this is selling to the EU, this is trading with the EU, anything that if your website is connected to the EU in any way, it will become a legal requirement to follow the WCAG 2.2 guidelines. So at the moment, there is no legal requirement but these guidelines make up a great framework for how to comply when it does become a legal requirement. 
So we are going to take a trip across the pond and visit America to see what is going on over there. They implemented some accessibility regulations a very long time ago. Um, the first is the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. This prohibits the discrimination of people with disabilities and requires that they're able to access the same places that able-bodied people are able to access. There is an amendment added to this called Section 508 in 1986 that states that this now um, applies to electronic technologies and needs to follow the WCAG guidelines. So here we have the WCAG again coming into play. We also have the American with Disabilities Act of 1990. And this states that businesses that offer products and services on their websites or mobile apps must make sure that people with disabilities have equal access. So these guidelines were put into effect much earlier than the guideline than our guidelines were. So um, how did the public react when websites didn't follow these guidelines? And I'll answer that question by asking another question, which is what do these three have in common? And why do we not want to be like them? The answer is they didn't respect the WCAG guidelines and they had to pay for it, literally. We have Domino's. Domino's was sued in 2019 by a blind customer that was unable to complete a purchase on the website using a screen reader. And then we have five guys who met the same fate when a customer was unable to order food from their website in 2017. Finally, we have Beyonce, who was also sued when uh, there was a class action lawsuit filed against her because her website, the sold concert tickets, was not accessible. In fact, there were parts of the website that you couldn't even access unless you had a mouse. So what does this mean for us? It's coming. So there's three things that we can think about um, from what I from these last few slides. The first is that the UK is always just a little bit behind America, so we can look at them for what's to come. We can also say that we'd rather be ahead of the game of accessibility than catching up when everybody's being penalized for it. And finally, if there's money to be made by cracking down on accessibility and you're not compliant, then you are probably going to be a target. So why wouldn't you want to do it? But we are going beyond compliance and we are going to look at the ethical case next. The real why wouldn't you want to do it? I'll start with this quote. Uh, from the Business Case for Accessibility a blog on the Lumar website. <clears throat> Accessibility is a fundamental aspect of web design that ensures that people with disabilities can access and use digital products and services on an equal basis with others. Despite the importance of accessibility, many websites and digital products are not fully accessible, making them difficult or impossible for people with disabilities to use. This not only causes frustration and inconvenience for people with disabilities, but it also represents a missed opportunity for businesses to tap into a significant and growing customer base. Then we remember the amount of people who have disabilities or the amount of people that need accessibility features and then the amount of the internet that's actually optimized for it. Then we remember that these numbers are underrepresented. And then we remember that this could be us at some point in our lives. Just think about Linda. So why wouldn't you wanna do it? Finally, I'll leave you with this. We are all just temporarily abled. So shouldn't we start building websites for our future selves? And now that I've given everyone an existential crisis, we'll start looking at the business case for accessibility, how accessibility, web engagement, keyword rankings, traffic, and revenue are all interconnected. Okay. So <clears throat> you are optimizing for accessibility. That's great. That means that you are improving your user experience. When you improve your user experience, this means that there's better engagement on your website, which means people are able to navigate your website more. More pages are clicked, more buttons are clicked, longer time is spent on your website. <clears throat> All of this better engagement works as a trust signal that's sent to Google, which then increases your keyword rankings. And we all know that higher keyword rankings means a larger audience. Larger audience is now interacting with your website a lot more. There's more engagement. This then cycles back around and gives you even more higher keyword rankings. By the way, this is when Linda found the website with the onesies that had really great accessibility and she bookmarked it. <clears throat> Finally, a larger audience ultimately leads to more revenue. So why wouldn't you want to do it? Maybe you do want to do it. 
maybe you just need to convince some stakeholders that it's worth the time, money and effort. So some of the common questions that you might get when you're saying that accessibility is an important thing to invest in is, is it worth the money? Is it worth the time? And does it actually work? We are gonna answer all of these. <clears throat> the first one is, is it worth the money? And a good way to answer this is to compare the cost of optimizing for accessibility to the cost of not optimizing for accessibility. So we're gonna say, is the cost of not optimizing for accessibility worth the cost of a lawsuit? In the American with Disabilities Act team found that there was a 12% increase in accessibility lawsuits in 2022. And in June 2025, the European Accessibility Act comes into effect. So if you're training with the EU, you need to follow the WCAG 2.2 guidelines. If you don't, this opens you up to the possibility of a lawsuit. Is it worth the cost of missed customers? So a study done by TGPI, which is an accessibility solutions company, found that 70, 75 to 80% of customer uh, service interactions for disabil disabled users ended in a failure. This group makes up at least 20% of the population. That's 100 million people in the EU. That's 16 million people in the UK. And that's one in five Brits. It's estimated that this customer base is worth 275 billion pounds per year. And they're also an extremely loyal customer base. So Mac Ader, or Matt Ader, the vice president of Vispero, that's also an assistive technology uh, solutions company, uh, says, as a disabled person myself being blind, I'll tell you that if people with disabilities feel comfortable engaging with a business, they're more likely to come back and be loyal. They often have so much trouble with the vast majority of digital assets that once they find one that actually accommodates their needs, they stick with it. Is it, the is it worth the cost of not investing early? So it becomes more expensive the longer you wait. The more pages that are built without accessibility features in mind, the more products that are added without optimized alt text, um, the more complicated it's gonna be when we need to optimize for accessibility in the future. And when this becomes a requirement, you, you won't have a choice. You'll have a big website that just needs to be completely fixed up. Keeping accessibility in mind as a core pillar of your website management can be a huge cost saver. So it's more profitable to invest in accessibility now than it is to invest in it later. Finally, is it worth the cost of lost keyword rankings and visibility, which we know ultimately leads to revenue? Like we mentioned before, optimizing for accessibility means that you're keeping UX in mind. This means that your websites are easy to navigate. This means that customers spend more time on your website which signals to Google that your website is trustworthy and useful. This increases your chances of ranking for higher keywords, which increases your visibility and traffic and ultimately the chance of converting customers. So why wouldn't you wanna do it? Is it worth the time? Though there are frameworks in, and guidelines that are already outlined that make it super easy to, fall, to adhere to the WCAG 2.2 guidelines. So there's no guessing needed. You have it all there. So that saves you loads of time. There's also um, automated accessibility software that makes it super easy to find the gaps and then plugins that make it super easy to then fill those gaps. And then um, maybe most importantly is to remember that you don't have to do everything. Uh, who's your audience? What do they need? Do that. Think of Linda. Who are your competitors? What are they doing? Do that plus a little bit more. And then keep an eye on your competitors to make sure that you're always doing just a little bit more than them. Finally, does it even work? To answer this, we are going to be looking at a couple case studies. So we have Reverie Retreat, which underwent a full website redesign with accessibility in mind. And this is a good um, time to say that if you're planning a website redesign, make sure that whoever is doing it is keeping accessibility in mind because this is going to be a standard moving into the internet after June, 2025. So back to Reverie Retreat, they optimized their website with accessibility in mind and found that they quadrupled their traffic and they also found that they were getting 50% more bookings on their website as opposed to Airbnb than they were before. We also have our favorite food shop place, Tesco. 
uh, they did not as much as Reverie Retreat. So they redesigned the navigation to make it more intuitive. They implemented clear and descriptive link text. This is important for screen readers and tabbing through websites. Uh, they used simpler language and they improved their page speed. And they found that their revenue quadrupled in one year. And they also found that they made uh, their pre-Christmas orders increased to 700,000 per week compared to 70,000 per week the year before. So uh, a good question to ask here is, are you seeing this kind of return from your shopping ads? Probably not. So why wouldn't you wanna do it? Finally, we are going to be looking at the factors that affect accessibility. And so this means that we are gonna be looking at the WCAG 2.2 and what this actually means. So this uses an acronym, uh, POR, which uh, stands for perceivable, perceiver, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And we'll be going through all four of these and talking about what these actually mean. So the first is that it needs to be perceivable. And so this means that users must be able to understand the information being presented and it can't be invisible to any of their senses. So um, an example of this could be that um, the navigation on a website changes from page to page. If someone has to relearn the navigation every time they move to a different page, then it's not going to be easy for them to navigate the website. Another example could be um, a Word document contains a bunch of non-English words and phrases. If it's not indicated that these are different languages, then how can assistive technology present this information correctly? Some examples of what you can do here to make sure that your website is perceivable is use alt text on images, use captions on videos, provide transcripts for audio files, add text to pages using HTML rather than CSS or JavaScript, which screen readers cannot read, avoid autoplayed videos and songs, and use colors with high contrast. Next, we have operable. And the operable part means that users should be able to navigate a website without a mouse. So this could be users that are blind, have lost limbs, or have extreme cases of arthritis. And examples of issues with this could be that mouse dependent web content is completely inaccessible without a mouse, um, like Beyonce. Um, or it could be that people with uh, low vision, um, cataract surgery, or you when you're 80, um, may not be able to see the mouse on the screen. And so you might have to use the keyboard to help you navigate the website. So what can you do to make this, make your website operable? Make all content accessible by a keyboard. Try tabbing through the site. Uh, provide enough time or give users control over time to read and use content. Avoid content that can cause seizures and avoid drag and drop elements. Next, we'll be looking at understandable. So this means that all content and website functions should be clear to all users. So um, other examples of this could be, again, website navigation changing from page to page, um, maybe abbreviations and acronyms are being used without explaining what they are. Uh, maybe you're using a high level of English that is inaccessible to some people. So what you can do here to make sure that your website is understandable, use labels and instructions. Use an eighth grade reading level. And for the non-Americans out there, that is around a 12 or 13 year old reading level. Provide supplemental information. So that could be summaries or excerpts of uh, before long articles written descriptions of information contained in charts or graphs, transcripts for audio and video files, and audio files that let people listen to a page rather than having to read through it. Um, other examples could be using consistent font styles and navigation and making sure that all form fields are labeled. This is how screen readers tell users what to put in form fields. Finally, you want your website to be robust. Oh, what does that mean? That means that all of your content should be accessible across multiple assistive technologies and should continue to be accessible despite evolving technologies. So um, examples of issues for this could be that maybe you need a certain web browser in order to access certain content, or maybe a document is inaccessible with a screen reader. And in order to make sure your website is robust, you just make sure that you're supporting outdated systems and browsers, you're functional across all devices and operating systems, and that you continue to update as technology develops. 
So we made it. Let's do a recap. You have a goal. We want to be compliant with the WCAG 2.2 by June 2025. Optimizing for accessibility improves traffic and ultimately revenue. And optimizing now is better than waiting and optimizing later. The guidelines are clear and laid out for us. And most importantly, we want to remember to be less like Beyonce and more like Tesco. And that is everything. If you would like more accessibility resources, uh, you can follow the Digital Maze, me or Boom Online on Twitter. Um, we're also going to have a document that has uh, multiple accessibility resources that you can access. Um, and we'll have that sent out later. Um, I'll pass that back over to Rob. Thank you very much. Katya, that was very well presented, very informative. A lot of stuff in there that I, I was not aware of either. So, yeah, and presumably we'll be looking at all this for a whole host of clients as well over the coming months and, and years. And particularly because we offer web design and, and SEO and PPC, it's, it's very, very important across um, the board, very clearly. So, so, yeah, thank you for doing that. I want to go to the viewers now and see if there is any questions. So feel free to pop them in the chat and I'll field them over to Katya and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, I do have one readily available. So how can small businesses prepare for the upcoming EU accessibility laws and what steps should we be taking or to start taking them now? Yeah, yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, definitely start as soon as possible. Um, you know, uh, try to identify gaps. Um, think about your audience. Um, how are they going to be using your website? Um, prioritize their accessibility needs and just follow the WCAG 2.2 guidelines would be the best way to start. Presumably starting as soon as possible. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Correct. Um, Leanne, who I believe you're related to. Yes, I am. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I noticed, I think, the parents or, or um, either one or two of the parents have joined up and that's great. It's my aunt, yeah. Uh, nice to see the support from the wider family there. Uh, so Leanne has asked, you talked about higher keyword rankings and I was wondering how much keyword rankings can increase by, you know, I presume by implementing these accessibility changes that you discussed. That's a that's a really, really good question. Um, and with all SEO um, answers, it's it depends. <laughs> and, um, it depends on what keywords you're targeting. It depends on um, the search volume for those keywords. Um, a good way to answer that is to say really like with SEO and keyword rankings, everything just kind of plays into the keyword rankings. So anything that you do will increase your keyword rankings so you can optimize your accessibility do a little bit of technical SEO on the side, all of it's going to improve it by a good chunk. So I can't say exactly how much it would improve it, but it does play into it because it is a trust factor for, for Google. So Google sees that and they're like, okay, cool. People are spending time on the website. Let's bring mm -hmm. these up so that more people find this website. And the second one is why music should be turned off on a video. So that would be um, any auto playing videos. So if there's somebody who is, um, blind, for example, and they're logging onto a website and suddenly music starts playing, they may not know how to turn it off immediately. So we would want to make sure that they have control over making sure that that over, over turning that music on and off. Brilliant. Thank you. So Chaz has asked if there's any particular sectors or industries that are notorious for having poor accessibility. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I would say... Um, and the first thing that comes to mind is, um, and this is just because I'm American, but the government websites in America, if you if you want to get a headache, um, visit the <laughs> irs.gov website. It's it's terrible. Um, but I would say I would say really all of them. Um, there's not there's not enough accessibility in in all sectors and industries. And um, if you'd like to have this audience who is um, kind of marginalized, start to view your sector or industry, then making your website accessible will include them in. So to answer your question, I would say just a whole rounded, most of the internet is just not optimized for accessibility. Cool. I think there's a really good question here from, from David, because I know, um, you know, we deal with a lot of, you know, small and medium sized businesses as well. Um, 
but obviously you know all this comes with a cost and when you're a small business you have to prioritize spending and where you should allocate budget and all that kind of good stuff so i mean what what kind of cost would you expect to make the average website compliant or is it not a one-off cost is it something that that happens ongoing that's a good question um it's a good question for my dad um um hi dad um to to answer your question um i would say it it shouldn't cost a lot so you can find some um pretty cheap uh, software or affordable software online that will tell you what gaps you have in your website. And then filling those gaps can be pretty easy using different plugins. Um, so um, I can't give like an exact cost of it because it would depend on the contractor agency that you're using. Um, but I would say that if you wanted to start looking into it yourself and seeing how like um, uh, what the ROI is on this, then using using these automated tools would make it much less expensive. And we'll have okay. a, we'll have a list of these tools as well that um, on the document that I'd like to share. Cool. I feel like your family's giving you a hard time now. Yeah, um, they are looking more. <laughs> what do we use to find the gaps? So by that, I presume is there anything we can use that that's yeah. like, like issues easily or. So there's um there's WordPress plugins that we can use, and there's also um, a load of other um, tools that you can use that they'll be on these documents that mm -hmm. I'll I'll pass out so that you'll be able to um you'll be able to find them on there. But in a good and that would be uh yes yeah, so that would be for someone who who might not know uh, like what they're looking for for accessibility. I would use those automated tools. Um, Another way you could do it is to have somebody who knows accessibility guidelines look at your website and do an audit through it. Um, and that may be a little bit more accurate because you then have the human element there going through it and telling you what you need and what is prioritized, what needs to be prioritized for your customers and your business. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, one question I actually had. So um, I know a lot of our customers will probably be, be wanting to talk about this now. Um, and when we talk to customers, we, we, we often want to sort of bring to their attention what the potential loss in revenue could be from their website if they don't do this kind of stuff. So what's the cost of inaction here? Um, mm. Can you quantify that at all? Do you have any data that, that, that can quantify, you know, the loss of revenue if you don't do this kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, we can look at what um, the stats that we uh, had on the slides here where um, you can say, you know, 20% 20, 20 of people who... Um, use assistive technology primarily to browse the internet um, uh, only have 3% of the internet to browse. So by creating an accessible website, you could potentially have that 20% of people. So um, I'm not sure how much of a percentage that would make to uh, compared to what you would have now, but that's 20% more people or 20% of the population yeah. So you take everybody in the world, 20% of the population uses assistive technology and you oh, would then be targeting well. that 20%. So there's a potential for an extra 20% there. Yeah, because, you know, obviously if 20% of people are not finding your website easy to use, that's 20% of people that maybe not convert in, so on and so exactly. forth. So that's really interesting, particularly if you've got a lot of traffic as well. If you've only got a small amount of traffic, that number is probably quite small. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. e-commerce business in particular that's driving hundreds of thousands, if not millions on a monthly basis, that's yes. a big chunk of revenue, isn't it, for sure? Yes. Um, cool. Is there anything, any tips for anybody who writes content, so anybody that contributes content to our website, anything, um, hmm. any tips you've got to make just generally writing content more accessible? Yeah, I would say um, definitely keep it at that 12 to 13 year old like um, like wording level. Like we want we want everything to be simple. We want it to be easy to read. That's not my max anyway. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <Same. laughs> so we want to keep it easy. And then we also want to uh, make sure that we have headers very clearly labeled. So um, we can look at the gov.uk website, for example, if you're writing content, they have their headers bold and like visible, and then they'll have a chunk of text underneath it makes it super easy to read. They'll use bullet points. Um, uh, links, um, so any internal links are very clearly um, indicated with like the bright blue text. So it stands out. There's large contrast there. Um, if you're making images for sites, just make sure that when you upload those images that they have alt text and a descriptive um, uh, file name. Um, the alt text is most important because that will help uh, screen readers, essentially screen readers read the alt text out to yeah. somebody who would be blind to describe to them what the image is. 
Um, so yeah, I'd say that those would be the tips that I would have for content. Cool. Wow. Any any further questions, folks? I think you've knowledge bombed us all there, Katya. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, if, if that's the end of the questions, um, we should leave you all to have a, have a great rest of the day. Thank you all for, for coming. Very much appreciative of, of, of your time. Like I could say, I you know it's a Thursday and everyone's busy with their jobs and to spend um, 35, nearly 40 minutes of it with us, we're, we're very grateful. And to you, Katia, as well, I know you've got a lot of client work to do and I'm, I'm very grateful that you've, you've made the time to put this together. Um, yeah, very much a valued member of the team. So, uh, yeah, very grateful for your time as well. Um, the recording will be available later on today. You should all receive a, a video of this at some point over the next day or two. So if you want to pass it over to wider teams or anybody who you feel could be interested, that would be great. Uh, we've been The Digital Maze. If you want to hear more or read more, we are at thedigitalmaze.com. And we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, Guy. Thank you. Thank you.